Good, good morning. <laughs> oh, that was getting better. I like it. Uh, hey, welcome to the house of God. I'm glad you're here. Uh, did you come ready to celebrate God and to worship Him in His presence? You know, when it comes to worship, worship is about being ushered into the presence of God. And that is our prayer, whatever chaotic things may be happening, Bruce, is, is our prayer is that let God take over and usher us into his presence. Do we need the presence of God? Amen. Amen. All right. So are you ready? So let's stand over the building and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And there's a lot of needs to be praying about, a lot of sickness going on. Uh, just different people that, of, the, of the house of God here and also across the, the nation. We need to be praying for our nation, this world. We need to be praying one for another. Uh, and so many things to be praying about. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and open our service. Heavenly Father, we worship you and praise you as our King. Father, Lord, I, I, we get sometimes discouraged and we start looking around us at the chaos, Father. But Lord, you bring sanity to the insanity. You bring wisdom to, to the, just the, the stupidity of this world. Uh, God, I pray that you give us eyes to see. And Lord, I dismiss and rebuke all discouragement in the name of Jesus. And Father, that we would see beyond and realize we live of another world. We are just ambassadors of yours. And Father, we live for your kingdom. And your kingdom will live forever. And Lord, we praise you and worship you as our king. Father, I pray each and every day that we trust you more each day. And God, we raise up all those that are hurting even now. Those that are sick, afflicted, or whatever things are going on in this world. The reality, Lord, our bodies are frail, but it's so great to know we get a new one. And Father, we, we raise them up before you, asking for your healing and strength yes. in their hour of need. Father, Holy Spirit, I pray that you just come upon them, Lord, and, and your presence be felt, and they know and just be encouraged in their hour of need. And Father, all those that are watching at home, God, I pray that they would also just experience you this morning. We give you praise in Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Let's stand and continue standing and praise God this morning. We know that the Word says that you can worship Him on the stringed instruments with the harp and with the tambourine and on the drums and with your voice. Can you guys hear me? Go ahead, brother. Father, this morning we come to You and we worship You, Lord. Father, we ask that the Incense of our praises go up to you, Lord. For you are holy and you're worthy, mighty God. Worthy of all the glory and worthy of the honor, mighty God. Worthy to be exalted and worshipped and praised. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords, the mighty God, the good shepherd, Lord. The lion of the tribe of Judah, mighty God, we bless you this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, mighty God. We enter your courts with praise, mighty God. Into your house with thanksgiving, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. We lift you up this morning, mighty God. We magnify you, mighty God. And we worship you, Lord. Come on, church. I don't want to be by myself in this thing. The rocks are going to cry out or somebody's going to say hallelujah. Somebody's going to say glory to your name, mighty God, for you are holy. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you, Lord. This morning, as we sacrifice a praise across the Altar of our lips, mighty God, that you'd receive it, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's give him a hand clap of praise this morning. <clears throat> well, look what the Lord has done. 
Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me, Lord, just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Every day is just the same. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Well, my God is a good God. Yes, he is. Oh, my God is a good God. Yes, he is. Oh, my God is a good God. Yes, he is. Well, my God is a good, good God. Yes, he is. Well, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me, Lord, just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Every day is just the same. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Make a joyful Amen. noise Amen. unto the Lord. You'll have to bear with us this morning. Uh, Bruce, I want to say that. We invite you in worship also to clap and to sing. If you're like me, I clap like this. I can't seem to get my rhythm right. I mean, <laughs> my rhythm is not. If I clap, it's going to mess you up. But some of you got some great rhythm, right? And God has gifted you with that. So feel free to engage in worship, even in clapping and praising God, exalting his name. <clears throat> Fill us with your power, live inside of me, for you're the living water, never drying fountain, the comforter and counselor. Take complete control. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. For you're the living water, never drying fountain, the comforter and counselor, take complete control, you're the living water. Never dying fountain, the comforter and counselor, take complete control, for welcome Holy Spirit, we are in your presence. Fill us with your power, live inside of me. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Open the eyes of my heart. I think we sang this a couple weeks ago in worship there. In the times we're living in, we need to have our eyes opened. And in the deception and the lies of Satan coming from every angle. But to see Jesus in His holiness, in the reality of His Lordship, and to see God, we do need to say, Lord, open the eyes of our heart every direction, Lord. The old hymn of, Oh, I want to see Him look upon His face there to sing forever of His saving grace. Mm, thank You, Lord. That's a song that the angels can't sing. They've not been redeemed like the saints of God have. Mm, no. So, <clears throat> open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 i want to see you open the eyes of my heart lord open Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. As we sing, holy, holy, you are holy, mighty God. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> You want to say something about this song, Scott? Yeah. About leaning on the arms of Jesus, on his <clears throat> everlasting arms? I mean, where else can you go in this world we live in other than Christ our Lord? He's a solid foundation. And today as we sing this song, we want to encourage you that whatever you're going through, whatever you may be going through at this time right now, 
You have a place to lean. You have a place that you can stand on, and that is on the leaning arms, everlasting arms of Jesus. We got on we on this one, brother. <laughs> well, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Lean on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Lean on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Lean on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, lean on Jesus. Safe and secure for my Lord. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning, I'm leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. just feel like we need to just worship. Sometimes you're trying to struggle with bringing the songs and the chords and the keys. We're going we're gonna to sing a song that's uh, He's worthy to be exalted. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth thou art exalted far above all gods for thou o Lord, art high above all the earth thou art Exalted high above all God, and I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. Your mighty God. For I exalt, we glorify your name, mighty God. I exalt thee, O Lord. I exalt thee, I exalt thee. I exalt 
This morning, mighty God, you're worthy of all the praise, mighty God. Can you bring my Bible up here, please? I wouldn't be want to be anywhere else but in the presence of God. Worship is all about being ushered into his presence. Uh, this is pray. Father, we exalt you. You are our king. God, we're in your presence. You are here, God. God, I pray you move through us, God. God, we know your presence. We know your heart. Speak to us today, God, by your word. Father, your word is anointed. It will last for an eternity. God, today, reveal it to our hearts. Your word is a living and alive and sharper than a two-edged sword. God, speak to us today. Lord, I pray you minister to our hearts and give us the word for the hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Well, it's a blessing to be in his presence above all things. Wouldn't want to have church without him. Amen? <laughs> a lot of people are today, unfortunately, but we need God now more than ever. I mean, through the centuries they've said that. We need God now more than ever. And I think even now we could say the same thing. We need God now more than ever. Can I get an amen on that, church? So today we're going to continue our study in the spirit-filled life. And I, I want to say thank you to Tom Wetzel, the guy back there, the unsung hero that is back there running all the sound and equipment, being flexible. Hey, I just... I so appreciate all those people behind the scenes that are doing many things just so we can come and worship God. So, Tom, thank you for all you do. Amen. So, today we'll continue the series, The Spirit-Filled Life. This is number four, and we're going to get you up to speed. We'll be shortly in Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Joshua 4, 1 through 9. Brother, this just won't work for me. He was using this earlier. Is it? Okay. Maybe I get in too much of a hurry. That's what it is. So Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Uh, before we read this scripture text, I want to get us up to speed with the children of Israel, which is a type of the church and even us today. And mind you, as last week we were talking about getting ready for the move of God. And we as a church need to be ready for the move of God. Church, are you ready for the move of God? Say amen. Hey, that was a little weak. So we need to get prepared and ready for a move of God. Last week we talked about sanctifying ourselves, purifying ourselves, and, and how that we need to get the rocks out of our jar, so to speak, get the rocks out of our life, so to speak, to let God flow. And we can sense his, his presence of brokenness even as he was ministering to your heart individually. Some of you spoke with me about some things in your life you're working with. And I praise God for the presence of God 
that would work and look at our hearts and our minds to prepare us to exalt his holy name. I believe that God in our day and age has many wonderful things he wants the church to do. And it's not catch. Aren't you glad that no matter what election, no matter what government leader may rise, nothing catches our God by surprise. Isn't that awesome? He is in charge and he is on the throne and he is in control. The question is, are you submitting to his life? Um, so, well, the children of Israel, they were poised and ready to cross the Jordan River. And Joshua told them to get ready and purify yourselves. They went through a purification process and be ready for the move of God. Now the time has come. Three or four million people poised and ready, and they're standing basically on the brink of the Jordan River. Now, uh, as they are ready to go, ready to move into the Jordan River, we must look at first some, some facts even at that time. The Jordan River... Uh, was is typically oh there thank you is uh, during most parts of the year is about maybe a hundred feet wide but during the harvest season as it's said in scripture whether it be through the spring to the fall can get up to even a mile wide so banks are overflowing so mind you three to four million people are poised and ready for a move of God they're ready for a move of God and there's this vast river in front of them and they're waiting to see what God will do and God says this to Joshua. He says, today I will, 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 your name will be exalted. You will be uh, noticed. You will be noticed even from the tribe of, from the Israelite nation as a leader that I have called. So Joshua was going to be uh, recognized as their leader even through the miracle of God. Now God said, gave specific instructions to the people of Israel. He said, What's going to happen is this. The priests are going to take the Ark of the Covenant. And they're going to lead first. The nation of Israel was to stay approximately a half mile back. A half, isn't it interesting how God has specific instructions for a move of God? He said they need, they're going to, you need to stay back about a half mile. And in doing so, the priests are going to lead. They're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, symbolically of the presence of God, and they're going to step into the water. And you're going to see a move of God. Mind you, this is another generation. The previous generation had witnessed the Red Sea crossing. And where they stood back, Moses was on the bank, and God parted the Red Sea, and they walked on what? Dry ground. Dry ground. But this is a whole other generation. A whole other people. And they're excited about going into the promised land. But it's going to take effort on their part. So the God gave specific instructions for the priest. And can you imagine the priest leading that day? Three to four million people behind you, about a half mile back. And the priests were taking the Ark of the Covenant, and they had to step into the water. And as they stepped, I get chills just thinking about this. As they stepped into the water, the waters stopped up and the deeper they went the more it stopped up until they got into the middle and God stopped the waters approximately 20 miles back God stopped the flooding Jordan River approximately 20 miles back at the city called Adam actually and stopped a wall of water can you imagine living in that city I, I just I, I'm kind of weird like that I think about the other people what they had to see so if you're in the city of Adam and you're seeing you're living close to the Jordan River and you see this wall of water stop up and there's dry ground in the other side of it, I kind of would wonder what's going on, right? I would wonder what's, this is, God's doing something. Man can't do this. So the people, but they had to exhibit faith. They had to follow God's criteria. You know, actually it says we're to be moving forward, church, by faith not by sight. No, we can look at our world around us and get discouraged and say, hey, we'll just hunker into our bunker, so to speak. We'll get to our little area. I don't know where that came from. Hunker in a bunker? I don't know. It's not my notes. Hey, we'll get into our little area and just you, me, and, and us three, and we'll get together and we're just going to ride this thing through. That's not what the Great Commission is telling us. Go ye into all the world preaching the gospel baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching to observe whatsoever things I've given you. Lo, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the earth. Hey, that's the great uh, commission, not suggestion, the great commission for the church today. Can I get an amen? That is for us to move forward. So we need to, that requires us, hey, I like to just kind of be one of you. And so if some of my things I say is not so politically correct. But that means we need to get off our duffs and get moving. Come on. We need to get off our duffs and get moving because we are expecting a move of God. So the God stopped the waters because they were moving forward. The reality is that unless we step out by faith and get our feet wet, we're not likely to make much progress in living for God. That means God has gifted each and every one of you differently, and some are similar. The expectation that God expects from you is to use them to do what he's equipped you to do. And while, Pastor, I can't preach, and maybe you shouldn't preach, but there's sure something you can be doing for the kingdom of God. There's sure something that you need to get moving by faith and get doing. Can I get an amen on that? You need to get moving and get doing. So the children of Israel were moving and doing God's will. We never stand still in the Christian walk. We're either moving forward by faith or backwards in unbelief. There is no standing still. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards in unbelief. Well, I kind of want to sit back and observe, Pastor. I don't really, I just want to see. After all, you don't understand. I've been hurt. I've been hurt. You don't understand. I'm going through this hardship. Want me to give you my pity committee? Want, hey, I tell you what. Lisa and I is going to have a party at our house this afternoon. We're going to have what's called a pity committee party. Okay? And we're going to moan and groan, I promise you. We're going to get it all out there. We're just going to tell you our problems for three hours. How many of you want to come? Don't you dare raise your hand, okay? <laughs> Don't you dare raise your hand. Because, uh, you know, hey, we got some issues in our day. And you say, man, Pastor, you kind of a mess. Hey, I'm just like one of you. I'm just one of you guys. Hey, we got some issues. But that doesn't mean you can stop the move of God. That still means we need to get off our duff and get moving. And let's move forward, church. Let's impact the people you meet every day. And we have so many means at our disposal we need to be using for the cause of Christ. Unless it's censored and cut off. Anyway, so, hey, in John 7, verse 37 and 38. There it is. It says, that Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his ha heart will flow rivers of living water. He who thirsts. Unfortunately, we have a, much of the church world today is not thirsty. And they're very dry and parched. And quite frankly, they're trying to, to drum up, if you will, by man-made devices trying to make church what they want it to be. My friend, we need to submit to God and His Holy Spirit and let Him move in our lives. And if we're thirsty, we will be filled. And out of our belly shall flow forth rivers of living water. I want some of that, do you? I want some living water. I want some living water. Well, what's interesting, we'll pick up now, that was just the getting up to where we want to be today, is in Joshua chapter 4, we're going to talk about Memorial stones. Memorial stones. And I'll read that today. Joshua chapter 4, actually verses 1 through 9. And I encourage you on your own to read all of it. And I'd read it all today, but some of you, your attention spans are just about that big. No? Yeah, it's somewhere in there. You know what I mean. So Joshua chapter 4. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan. They'd walked over. The priest had done what they were supposed to do. The waters were stopped up. And there was dry ground. All the nation, three to four million people, had walked over through the Jordan River on dry ground. And it says that when the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, and the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for your, yourselves twelve men from the people, one from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priests 
feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Verse 4. And Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you shall take a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. This may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you will answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Verse number 9, 8 rather. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded them, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them there. Verse number 9 is rather peculiar. It says, Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan River, in the place where the heel of the feet of the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Isn't it amazing that he had, God had commanded Joshua and said, designate 12 men, one from each tribe. Now, come on, get up to speed with me. 12 men, one from each tribe. How many tribes of Israel were there? Come on, someone geniuses. Okay, good, thank you, you're with me. 12 uh, stones, one man was to gather from the, the, from the bottom of the Jordan River. And you're saying, are we about the stones again today, Pastor? Yes, I am. There we go. How many can see that? It's just a stone. It's pretty heavy. There. So I got that on my wife's flower garden. She said, make sure you bring that back. Okay, I got it. So don't let me forget that. So he said to get 12 stones from the bottom of the, of the uh, Jordan River where the priest had stood. One man from each tribe, gather the stone, put it on your shoulder, and take it to the place where we're going to lodge. Now, some of you think, okay, well, that's just on the other side of the river. They lodged in Gilgal, which is eight miles eight miles. So these men gathered the stones and put them on their shoulders and walked eight miles. I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I think I'm kind of weird this way. I'm thinking if I'm chosen to be one of those 12 men and Joshua said, hey, get a stone. We're going to take it where we're going to lodge. But he didn't tell me I was going to carry this thing eight miles. I may have got a little smaller stone. Are you like me? You're kind of a little, it's a little smaller. But uh, they got a stone from the Jordan River. And what's so important is why? Why would they get these stones from the Jordan River? See, they got these 12 stones, and they were stones of remembrance. Stones of remembrance. See, my friend, God sets up memorials that we may remember how great he is. He sets up memorials for us to go back to because we need reminded, constantly reminded, what he did for me, even the day of your salvation, even the day that he healed you from whatever it may be, maybe the day he provided that spouse you've been praying for, maybe the day that, and you can fill in the blank, we need memorials reminding us of his miraculous power. If any of you have been around the church for any long length of time, you probably find yourself saying, I remember when... God moved in this one service that was amazing. Or I remember we are to continue to do that, but that doesn't mean we, go, we have to go back. We need to move forward by faith. See, he wanted to get these stones. Why? Because God knows how we are. I, I get real forgetful sometimes. Sometimes I'll go in a room to get something, and I think, why am I here? I forgot what I was getting. Come on, are you with me, or am I just getting older? I don't know. I, I forget sometimes, and I, some of the way you laugh, I understand, you understand what I'm talking about, right? And I, say, I say to my wife, what was it I was getting? Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. She's my completer, for sure. But the reality is that there are things that God knows how we are. He says, I want to set up these stones as a reminder of what I've done for you that you may never forget. For you see, even in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, it says it this way. 
I'll read it from here. Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God. <clears throat> the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. My friend, church, do you want a future generation that's serving God? Church, today you need to be talking about God, not just in church. You need to be telling your kids, diligently teaching them the stories of old even, even knowing about the move of God. The kids need to understand the power of God so that when we, if we are struggling with our new generation, then we need to look right here in our own hearts, in our own houses. Because we need to be diligently teaching and talking about God each and every day. I used to hand out my outlines to the church I pastored, and some people would actually take them home, and they would study that for that week, or they would teach their children. And my wife actually was doing children's church, and she would, what I was teaching on, she would ask me, and she would make material that would coincide with the teaching so that the kids were hearing the same story. So because we need to teach our children, teach our kids the ways of God. God sets up memorials in even such a fashion that he set up one that, quite honestly, the church neglects more than it should. It's called the Lord's Table. You know, I, I've been around church, and some of you have been around for quite a while. I'm 57 years old, and I've pretty much been in church 57 years. Okay? I've seen a lot of stuff. And it discourages my heart even when it comes to the Lord's Table, which says right in the front of that, Probably this do in remembrance of me. Is that what it says right there in front of that table? Because most all of them do. This do in remembrance of me. Is that the church will argue, I don't think you should take it every Sunday. I don't think you should take it every month. I don't think, quite frankly, if you need reminded, take it every day. Hey, I think we ought to offer it in churches here every day because sometimes we need reminded quite frequently about the death of burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that he is risen from the dead he's alive and well and seated at the right hand of the Father and we're going to see him someday if you submitted your life to Jesus Christ we need reminded that he's in charge and our government is not we need to be reminded that nothing's catching him by surprise, surprise and that he will see us through and that if you are a Christian a child of God that you have a blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine we need reminded so if we need to offer communion every Sunday every three Sundays or every day we need reminded at that memorial that Jesus is risen from the grave can I get an amen on that we need reminded that he is risen he is real he's alive and well but there's one, that's the memorial stones that, that Joshua had them set up in Gilgal so they could refer back to, even to, that, to this day, that could remind them of God's miraculous power. Which, by the way, it's interesting how God works things out. You know, Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan in this same area. Isn't that amazing? That even the same area that God would bring us back to. God's about memorials, because we need reminded. But there's one that's really peculiar to me is that not only the memorials that we need constantly reminded is this next one that's actually in verse 9. Verse number 9. God had commanded him to get the 12 men, get a stone, and set it up 8 miles away, 2 miles from Jericho, the first battle. In verse number 9, it says it this way. Joshua set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. I was reading different commentaries, and, and, and uh, some of them I definitely agree with. One in particular tried to kind of excuse this, saying, well, the verbiage doesn't mean that. After all, why would Joshua set up stones in the middle of the river? And he tried to dismiss it, and I, I dismissed that commentary on that one pretty quick, because... 
Joshua did that for a reason. Now, mind you, let's kind of get up to speed here. There's two memorials we're talking about. One is the stones at Gilgal that you could, they could go to and refer to, visibly seen. The other one is buried, when the waters resumed, was buried under the Jordan River. Was buried under a river. Now, I don't know about you, but you've been around water. You know kind of what. And you would ponder that you couldn't see those stones anymore. But you knew they were there, but they were gone. You could no longer see them. Why would Joshua put a memorial in the bottom of the Jordan River? My friend, we need to sometimes bury the past and move on. Bury the past and move on. See, for a spirit-filled life, we need to be refurbished every day. And sometimes, you see, things happen in our lives that we can't let go of. But Pastor, you don't realize, uh, I was divorced 10 years ago, and to this day, I just really, hey, let it go. But Pastor, you don't understand. I had a rough childhood. I had a lot of things in my life, and I don't even understand where love is. I'm going to tell you where love is. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's you. Bury your stone. Bury your stone. Put the past behind you. Otherwise, the stone could be really heavy. And it's not bad to hold right now. You can maybe hold it. But I, I would love to do an example if I had time. I have one of these young guys that are strong, young guys come up here and say, hold the stone out here, right here. Okay, no, no, I said out here. Okay, I, I'd almost be honored enough to have you one come do that, but some of you may be too strong, we can't stay that long, I don't know. But you do that very long and it gets really heavy, really heavy. I, I'm thinking about doing it, I don't know. But it gets really, as a matter of fact, Hey, who wants to come? I see one. You want to come up here? You know? You know what? You don't have to. Come on. <laughs> you don't have to. That's all right. I just thought they'd be honored enough to try it. You okay? Yeah, you come on up. You want to? Okay. All right. Well, you hold that out there. You think, I'm tough, but you hold that very long. It gets really heavy. And it, I already feel the pain already. And it gets really heavy. And for too long, you start feeling it bring you down. For your hair to hear. And it gets heavier and heavier. My friend, when we keep our past in the presence, that's exactly what happens. It gets heavier and heavier. And God can only use you so much. See, the hardest thing I believe in when it comes to forgiveness is forgiving yourself. Is forgiving yourself. So I love this story. And if you're like me, you, need, uh, you should love the story. What God is symbolically saying is, bury the past and see it no more. I've got a plan for you. I've got a future ahead of you. And you are your worst enemy. I feel like I'm, I'm talking to some people right here. Come on. I'm, I'm talk. I can feel it. I can feel it. I know it. You are your worst enemy. And what's holding you back from a spirit-filled life is yourself. Well, what, what can I do, Pastor? Because I've not been in church 57 years. You've been in church 57 minutes around there. And God wants to use you. And he's speaking. Isn't that amazing, God's mercy? Is that it can be, I've not, if I've been in 57, okay, I know how people think, okay, I'm one of them. Uh, I've earned something, I've been in church 57 years, I got this huge, have I earned anything? You could be within the sound of my voice, today, at this moment, this stone is as much yours as as it is mine. And we've got to get it behind us. My friend, you need to bury your past. 
Boy, this is, this is strong. I'm going to dwell here for a little bit because some of you are pondering this and you're letting it sink in and you're thinking about what's been holding you back and it holds you back in life. It holds you back in your marriage. It holds you back in your family. You think, I can't be that kind of father. Yes, you can. I can't be that kind of wife. Yes, you can. I can't be that kind of worker. Yes, you can. You are your worst enemy. It's time. I wish there was a Jordan River right here. I just did. Don't you love the sound when a rock drops in the river? Boom! It's gone. Good luck finding it again, right? But what we're doing sometimes, I've seen this for years. People come to the altar, and I don't know if you can get me on film. I'm going to go down here anyway, hey, if you, whatever. They come to the altar, and they bring their stone, and they bring it, and they bring it up here. Says, God, help me. God, I pray that you just deliver me. Lord, set me free. Fill me with your spirit, and then we get up from the altar, and we take our stone. Oh, yeah, don't let me forget this. And you wonder why you're not blessed. Why is it we harbor this hard feeling? It's like it becomes part of our makeup. My friend, the message today is that we need to be reminded of God's mercy and what he's done. And he's a miracle-working God, and he works miracles today. And that he has a plan for his church as much as he had a plan for the children of Israel. But church, much of our problem is ourselves. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I was in church one time, and so-and-so said this, and so-and-so. Let it go. But you don't understand, Pastor. I'm not a, I never could understand this statement. I, being a UPS driver all those years, I heard a lot of things in the world today. I, you're with, I'm with you, okay? This one was one is like, oh, if I ever went to church, the walls would cave in. You ever heard that before? I never quite understood that. What do you mean? The walls? I guess they're meaning that they don't feel like they would belong. Shame on the church. Shame on the church. No, this is the perfect place for you to come before Jesus Christ and you to lay your stone here. And I'm telling you, I'm no better than you. I'm telling you it's time to bury the past and it's time to move on. Leave your stone behind. Just get a visual in your mind of throwing that heavy stone into a river and that kerplunk noise. And it's gone. You can't get it again. That's what your past needs to be. You can't experience the, the flow of the Spirit of God when you're still carrying that garbage. You've got to let it go. And I know without a doubt, I'm speaking to you. I'm looking around the room, but there's some people's hearts. I just sense a major heaviness. And you're saying, could this be true? Could this be true that I can truly bury my past? You, Pastor, but you don't understand what I did in college. You don't understand what I did in high school. You don't. I know what sin is. And I know no matter what you've done, we serve a great big God that's willing to forgive you of all your trespasses and all your sin. You are your worst enemy. It's time for you to bury your past and let it be gone. Let it be much like the river we saw where it's under the water and you can't even see it anymore. And you know what you're going to experience when you do that? You are set free, and you are set free indeed. Isn't it great that you're here today, and your slate can be wiped clean? <laughs> That's a pretty good feeling. Your slate can be wiped clean. See, we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness. He is faithful. Our God is faithful. Even when we're faithless, he is faithful faithful. I feel in my heart just some heaviness for the body today. Whether it be in this room or online, I feel a heaviness that you are willing, you're wondering to do that. And I just want to dwell in the presence of God and that the message I'm telling you is really that good. See, we live in a world where you don't know what to believe. But I have a message here of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm reminding you that he paid the price for all sin.
sin. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can be set free. And set free indeed. And that you are your worst enemy. And you need to get that stone out of your life. See, Jesus, you know, often we, we pray, even when we pray. One thing, uh, okay, let me just say a little bit here. Uh, I've been working part-time at the funeral home, too, just because I'd done so many funerals. I said, hey, you want to employ me? And I said, sure. So I work part-time, okay? So I, I've listened to quite a few funerals and ministers that do funerals other than me, okay? Um, quite honestly, some of them uh, have done well. Some of them have been... Disappointing, I will say that. But the reality is that I went to one yesterday. And as I heard the person speaking, and I realize this is online, so I can get myself in trouble probably, but just they put everyone in heaven. They spoke to everyone as if they were speaking to the body of Christ, saying, hey, you have blessed assurance, and we're all going to heaven. My friend, I want to tell you the truth. I want to tell you the truth. You are not going to heaven except you have a Savior. My friend, I don't care how good you are. You, listen to me. You are not going to heaven unless you have a Savior. And that Savior paid the price for all your sins. I did a funeral two weeks ago of a dear sister that I was her pastor for nine years. I loved her. But I could, have, I could preach that funeral knowing she had made reservations in heaven. She knew her Savior. And I could truly celebrate her life. And I could challenge the people and say, hey, she made her reservations. You know where she is. She was not perfect, but she knew the one who was. And even in her final moments, based on what the testimony they told me, because you know what's sad? I had COVID at the time. I couldn't even go visit her. That tears me up. But they told me in her final the moment, family said that she was praising God and telling them it's going to be okay. Hey, that's blessed assurance. So I could preach her funeral saying, hey, people, of, people listen to me. She made her reservations. She's a, a daughter of the king, and she's celebrating in glory. But if you want to see her again, you too need to submit to a Savior in Jesus Christ so you can make your reservations and be ready to go. And when you made your reservations, they can't be deleted. They can't be wiped out. You are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. And my friend, in doing that, you realize that the blood of Jesus Christ forgives you of all sin. And you need to quit going to the Lord in prayer and saying, God, forgive me of something I did 10 years ago. He says, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. That's under the water. That's under the blood. I don't even see that anymore. Don't keep talking about something I don't see. I have forgiven you from that. It is gone and move forward in the name and power of the Holy Spirit. Get moving. Stop the pity committee. No one wants it. No one wants it. By the way, we are not having a pity committee at 3 o'clock. Don't come to our house for that. We're not. Just for clarification, someone may actually show up. And I'm going to say, hey, if you're here to have pity, I'm here to celebrate. So let's change this party another way, okay? Okay? Hey, come on. Some of us have been living in our pity committee way too long. There's some things that we need to remember of the powerful move of God because that encourages us and builds our faith. But my friend, there are some things, some heavy rocks that you need to get rid of at the altar and leave it there. Don't take it back home. Don't even pray about it anymore. Don't even try to tell God about it. He says, I, I did this a while back, and my wife says, oh, I can't believe you did that. But it's like, you, it's like God saying, well, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? 
<laughs> yeah, see, I got some laughs. Like, okay. Well, what are you talking about? That's under the blood. I see a sanctified believer. One is walking in the Lord. My friend, today is your day. I got great news for you. Today you can be set free. Well, Pastor, you just said I'm set free through Jesus Christ. Yes, you are. But quite frankly, some of you can relate to this rock you've been carrying for a long time. One time I did a service and I had a log chain I brought. And I said similar type thing. I said, this log chain has got you bound. You're bound up. And it's locked you up. And you need to let go of that log chain and set it free. When I let go of the log chain, you can hear the chatter. The I said, some of you need to come up here. And you need to get unbound. Forgive yourself and move forward. And we had people coming forward, grabbing that chain and throwing it down. Throwing it down. And you can hear the rattle of the chain. You can feel, just you can hear it being said. I said, don't you dare take that back. It's staying right there. Maybe symbolically you need to come before the altar. But who, who, I don't want someone else to think something. Who cares about someone else? It's your rock. It's time to get rid of it. They can't do it for you. Oh, that preached too. I could be here a few more hours. They can't do it for you. Only you can. And you can bury that thing deep. Because God is faithful. Don't talk about it anymore. Don't remind it. You're set free. I'm going to leave this rock right here. And you're not going to take it back. One, it's my wife's. I've got to take it back home. Okay? Secondly, if you need to come to the altar, and would you just dim the lights? Can we do that? Can we dim the lights a little bit? And this is an opportunity for you, okay? Why do we dim the lights? Well, just so you won't be looking around at everyone else. That's all it is. This is your day. Don't miss it. <laughs> Don't miss it. This is your day to be set free. If you need to come to the altar, and you need to literally pick up the rock, and set it down like that, and pray, and leave, and leave the rock behind. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. I know without a doubt there's someone in this room that needs to come up here and just lay it before the altar and be free of that thing forever. I love the song even we sang about purifying our heart, but also our mind. Our mind could be our worst enemy. And you need to change the way you think. In Peter, I feel like preaching a long time, so I, I got to just... In Peter, it says, gird up your loins. And you're like, what does that mean in King James? 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, gird up your loins of your mind. I means purify your mind and get moving. When it means gird up the loins, they would actually lift up their, their, the, the, the clothes that, that they wore because it was binding and get moving and they got running. They gird up their loins. Your mind is your worst enemy. You are your worst enemy. And today, hey, quite frankly, also... Those that know that person, if they do come to the altar, don't remind them of the past anymore. It's gone. Quit it. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Change your mind. Change your heart. I want to give you a few moments to do that. I will be over here to the right. If you wish for me to pray for you, as like an elder praying for you, I'm more than happy to do it you with all. If you're feeling sickness, we'll pray for you. But I want you to be alone with your God. I'm not going to come over here to you I'm going to be over here. It's about you doing business with God. It's about you burying that stone. And it's time you do it. Would you please come, even now, to the altar as we sing something, play something, as we sing or play something in the name of Jesus. Give you a few moments to respond. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, as they're coming today, I pray by your spirit, God, that you would just teach us to empty ourselves and even our past. 
that we can put that memory behind us finally and bury that stone deep. God, today, by your Spirit, not by anything I've done, but by your Spirit, we proclaim victory, God. Father, I pray for all those within the sound of my voice, that they, those that need to respond will respond. And not care about what anyone else is seeing or saying. This is about them and God. Because some of, some of us need to bury our past. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the splendor of the king